Okay. All right. Welcome back to another episode of What Do You Know, Joe. I have a great guest with me, a uh, professional cross athlete, uh, businessman, and someone who I think everyone's going to enjoy learning from and hearing speak. Uh, I'm talking about a guy named Mark Glassini. Mark, thank you so much for joining me, man. How you doing? Joe, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Of course. Um, we were kind of talking a little bit in the beginning, and I think there's some really cool topics to be had, and I think a lot of people are going to love learning a little bit more about not only what your career has been like on the field, but off field, what you're doing with other athletes and things you're proud of. I know you mentioned uh, the Meaningful Growth Foundation. We're going to talk a little about that, but I always like to start from the very beginning, figure out what made Mark such a, you know, so far so great individual and doing some great things for people and himself. So let's, you know, start all the way back. So you grew up in Mawa, New Jersey. So where, where is that? In all the way to northern New Jersey. Yeah, okay. my, both my parents are from northern New Jersey as well. And uh, my da dad was originally working out of Connecticut, but my mom did not want to leave New Jersey. So it's the northernmost town in New Jersey, about 20 miles outside of New York City. Born and raised in northern, uh, northern New Jersey, and now I live in West Palm Beach, Florida. Cool, 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 cool. So like growing up, did you have any siblings or family-wise? Were you just, you know, what were you, what were you doing growing up and were you – you know, on top of, you know, in the classroom where outside of that, what, what, what other sports were you playing? What sports were you playing? Yeah, I have one older sister, uh, still very close to her. Uh, my awesome. mom was a four or five plus tennis player. Uh, my father uh, played ball with me every single morning take, before taking that hour and a half drive up to Connecticut. I, awesome. I think one of my first words that I said was ball and I played every sport under the sun. Uh, besides ice hockey, and I think it's because of ice time early in the morning. And to this day, ice hockey is still my favorite sport to watch because of the speed and physicality, which is ironic. I played every sport growing up, uh, specifically baseball, uh, football, basketball, lacrosse, and soccer. I gave up soccer right around middle school. I gave up baseball when uh, I found the lacrosse stick just because it was the same season. And, and mm -hmm. then in high school, I played basketball, football, and lacrosse. I ended up taking lacrosse to the next level. So question from that, too, and I, I've seen great athletes do it. Shout out to Eric Goins, potentially the kicker for Notre Dame football, go Irish. He was the same kind of situation in lacrosse, football, basketball, but he also maintained, you know, uh, you know, some good grades and he was a high level athlete where we're in the classroom. Uh, uh, you know, was, was 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 it important to be well successful in and out of the classroom as well while you were on the field? Is is that something that was something big to you? Personally, I could have done better in high school for sure. I'll admit that. But like, you know, I always find it in interesting to know. I, I would say I've always been focused in the classroom. My fifth grade when I picked up the lacrosse stick for the first time. I had an ex-Marine uh, head of D DEA agent and uh, head of homicide of uh, Manhattan. And he was my first lacrosse coach. So kind of a tip of the spear individual that uh, helped, helped me uh, find discipline yeah. early on. Obviously, my parents infused the work ethic in me and uh, grades were always important because I was a student before I was an athlete. I would just point to the fact that just like I pointed out already, I was really into sport and and there's a there's a funny saying you can be agile you can be hostile you can be mobile but it doesn't matter if you're ineligible right so what you want to focus nice. on is just making sure and i say this to the younger athletes it is really about diligence much more than intelligence when you're right. in elementary middle school and high school you just got to stay the course because there's so many different distractions and i remember when i was a young uh gentleman I, I, even 15 years old my, my dad said I put my little paw in his hand. I shook his hand and I told him that I wouldn't drink throughout high school. So I was one of those rare individuals who had to deal with a lot of peer pressure and, and things like yeah. that. And what, I didn't uh, touch alcohol until I committed to play at the next level. And I think it was something that I would point to in, in terms of staying and avoiding distractions and, and focused on the diligent side of things. And I look back on those times. It was not easy. Right, because there's it's very um, hard to deal with the influences and being rejected, and and, and, and but I just loved it. I, I loved sport, and I knew that if I could play sport at a high level, but also stay diligent academically, perhaps get to a school that I probably couldn't get in just to on, on grades alone. Yeah, no, and I think as you set that up, I think those are, it's like you said. You're, I look at that as you're very fortunate because. Finding that is key, and the fact that you found it so early, I think, like you said, that's just going to better you for success sooner. And I think that's a huge, you know, something that I look back on. I and mean, like, if I had just 
learn how I need learn to you know apply myself. If I had done that sooner, that could have been something that definitely I think motivated me more and done something. So, you know, as you were going through your, when did you kind of know that in your high school career that you were, you know, maybe able to play at the next level? Like, was it, you know, was it maybe in like the fall time or other times when you were playing like travel or something like or club where were you getting looks or when did you kind of, you know, start getting looks and then, you know, what, what school we know, what will, we'll, Spoiler, he went to Yale. Um, what what other schools were maybe kind of like tapping on your shoulder or what were you looking for? Yeah, I'll tell that whole experience just because maybe there's a young high school athlete that's paying attention to this. I, I was always uh, pretty athletic. However, however, I was undersized. So I remember being 5'5", 155 as a freshman, 15-year-old. And one of my club coaches, by the time I was a sophomore, said to me, you won't play at the next level because you're undersized. And I really committed myself to the weight room my sophomore summer. Uh, I was hitting puberty at the same time. I went from under 170 pounds to over 190. It was something that I totally committed to. I, by the time I was a junior in high school, I was 6'1", 195. So I felt like I was physically capable to get to different spots on the cross field. And I ended up winning North Jersey Player of the Year. My senior year, I was held back because I broke my L2, L4 stress fracture in my lower spine. So I was a player coach for my senior year. And then two months into that, my mom got diagnosed with stage three lymphoblastic lymphoma. So uh, I went through a bit of an identity crisis, Joe, where I, I was not only coming undone a little bit physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, which has a lot to do with what I do now in Marco Senior Peak Performance, working with athletes and executives on mind, body, and spirit approach to sport and performance psychology. I wish I had somebody at that time. I was writing a lot of poetry, visualizing, and, and trying to come out of where I was. My mom got healthy again. Uh, she's now uh, heavily involved in what we're doing on the board of the Meaningful Growth Foundation that we started in January 2021. That story, though, gives a little bit of background about how that journey played out. It was not just this physical performance that I had to find, but I had to find mental performance, which is what I'm obsessed with teaching and learning and coaching to this day. And to answer your question uh, specifically, I was very under-recruited. I remember like three years plus of not getting any uh, email back from any coaches. I finally had uh, Coach McCormick from Williams, who's still there, uh, offered me to go play lacrosse and football and I ended up turning it down because I wanted to play division one I declared postgraduate year I went to Deerfield Academy and and once I played my fall of my senior year I was offered by Yale Harvard and Georgetown and I ended up going to Yale because of Andy Shea who's still the head coach there and is kind of a tertiary father figure for me and uh still one of the most amazing men in my life and and helped me keep continue to build me even though I had great like I said parental guidance uh, great coaches and mentors like Brian Callanan, uh, Chip Davis at Deerfield, and then beyond all the way through Yale. Yeah, and I, I think you kind of hit on it. Um, it's kind of, you know, when you have that relationship with someone, and I think if they can be that, you know, a big figure for you, I think that means a little bit more. And that definitely, the fact that you still talk to him today and you still know him well, I think that says a lot too about the relationship. So at your time at Yale, did you ever, you know, were things like, you never know how things are going to go, especially especially during college and the path you were on before. Did the things go, you know, what was your college experience like while playing Division One? again, managing both the classroom and everything? Because that's also what takes a toll on your, you know, on your mind. There's a lot going on. And you're also trying to figure out what you're going to do or not even figure out what you're going to do, but th you're starting to think about those things. So, like, Tell us a little bit about that, but then also maybe some success you saw on the field as well. I've always loved training, Joe. Ever since I found the weight room and, and, and sport, it's, it, it's not something that's difficult for me. I've always, uh, whether whatever day it is, I look to break a sweat, to uh, better my, my mind and my body that way. It wasn't until my junior year I had already won maybe like spirit or conditioning awards already, but my junior year uh, I was kind of going through – I guess you could call it performance anxiety of some kind. And, and we had a mental coach. I said, but I didn't know there was such a thing. And he helped me through an Ivy League championship game the night before at Brown University. And I still use those mental skills that I learned that day uh, in my pro career. And, and ever since that, it kind of 
gripped me, Joe, I would say, and, and never left me because you can train three things. You can train your mind, your body, and your craft. And I was doing a, a above average job in the craft, certainly superior in terms of the body at that time. I just didn't know how to train the mind. And, and now mm-hmm. I understand how to do it and I'm helping others do it as well. And once you start to find talent being equal, such as at the division one level and such as at the pro level and the Olympic level, it's going to come down to mindset and mental calmness and composure under pressure. And, and those are the things now that I not only teach, but I look to learn every single day. So uh, to answer your question on what my journey was like, I, I was fully committed to the weight room. And then my junior and senior year, I think what took me to the next level and allowed me to get drafted was finding uh, a way to take care of the space between my ears. That's awesome, man. And a little bit, I have lots of dissect there too, in the sense of so many great things you said, but the one on the lacrosse side, so was your freshman year 26, when was your freshman year at Yale? 2013, graduated in 2016. Okay. So did you ever have like, were there any games that maybe like stuck out to you where either like maybe it was a game where like you, like you said, you're like, I think it was your junior year where you had like that performance anxiety or something like that, where like maybe a game stuck out that like made you, you know, want to like be better mentally or like a game that sticks out where you remember it being maybe pivotal at some point in your career in college? I think throughout my college career, the thing that I would point to that I'm most proud of is that I played in every game, you know, sometimes with uh, with injury. Uh, we played at UPenn. When you asked ask me that question, we played at UPenn. We already were 0-2 or 0-3 in the Ivy League. We went into overtime. Uh, they came down, almost scored, and we won the game to go one and three in the Ivy. If we if we lost that game, we would have been kicked out. And then 2013, we ended up winning the Ivy Championship. I won it three out of four years there because I think the culture, awesome. the talent, and and the love we had among guys. And then I would say one of the things individually that sticks out for me is when we played Princeton. Uh, I remember still a good buddy to this day had ten goals, Jake Ficaro. And I end up having the last one, and, and we won 16-15. It was my only goal of the game, but it all goes back to the kind of performance under pressure sort of things. And mm-hmm. then I think if I was to point out kind of some of the the dark side of it, I remember being up to my freshman year at Bird Stadium in Maryland against Syracuse, and we lost the game. So I guess it all funnels into that performance under pressure situation. Those are like the three moments that I would really – to click to right away uh, as ones were either thrive or or fell up short in, yeah. in, the, in the pressure situations. And I think those situations, like you kind of said with the three things you can, you know, perfect or you're not even perfect, but work on, you know, in those situations of overcoming something, you can take two paths, you can sit and, so, you know, sit and dwell, or you can maybe look to see how you can grow from it. And I think those are how you can continue to be successful and learning that that growth is good and, like there's there's value to the growth is you know it, it i think success can sometimes be suggestive and or sub, subjective excuse me and i think you can see success and things people might see failure in and i think that's something that you know if you just have that good mindset to carry that with so um you mentioned a little bit on the other side of it you know we'll get into the pll but like what were you studying in the background at Yale? what was something you were was it business like administration or something business meant or like deeper into that like specifically like what were you in the classroom looking at I, w- I was an economics major. I focused in environmental products. And, and even when I got drafted to play major league lacrosse, just because the sport wasn't there yet in terms of giving um, benefits and, and then yeah. salary that's worthwhile, I was playing and working on Wall Street for my first two years out of college. So my focus was uh, environmental products again. I was a broker at uh, BGC Partners, a spinoff of Cantor Fitzgerald in New York City, Manhattan. And we, I was on the renewables desk, so I was brokering renewable energy credits, everything that was green from hydro, wind, solar, and I pivoted away at the end of 2018 to start the business that I have now. I went out and got Mm -hmm. certified in fitness training and nutrition, but my real obsession was the sports psychology piece, which I'm still in graduate school to this day doing. So I would just say when I was at Yale, it was economics. I always was gripped by the performance under pressure and performance psychology side of things, such mm-hmm. as I read Boys in the Boat, which is still one of the best books I've ever read uh, during mm-hmm. my time at Yale. It was economics and that. Awesome, man. And I think a lot of people, 
don't realize it. And I think especially coming out of school, you think that's where you like a lot of people, you know, can pivot in their careers. And like you said, you've probably learned a lot of, I think a lot of skills people learn, especially early in their career and in the jobs that they have can be transferable as long as you think about how you can apply those skills. And I think that's something that's huge too. I'm sure you probably carried some of those skills that you picked up and that probably, you know, helps with that business. So I think that's huge. Um, so, you know, let's, let's definitely dive into kind of more what you're doing now too, especially. So Pilo, where did you get drafted and like, when did this start? Like, were you playing in the NLL too? Like, or was it strictly like PLL and like when you were, or when the PLL joined, you were finally like, Oh, this is going to be awesome. And, when did you like how, tell us a little bit about the beginning journey? Cause you like, you know, you were an all-star, you won a championship, would love to learn just kind of like where you've seen it, like the, the beginning inkling of the idea potentially all the way to 2024. Absolutely. And before I answer that, I'll just make one note on the transferable skills, something that sticks yeah. with me even to this day, my manager director on my desk, Nicole Shaughnessy, who I still stay in touch with. She really held me to a high standard there, just like as if she was a coach on, on my uh, of, of, on the lacrosse field. And one of mm-hmm. the things that I learned from her is LEP. Uh, people will work with you if they like you, you can execute and they trust you and you must have all three. So it's just something that I took away even to this day. If you only have two or three, they don't work with you for, for that uh, one other reason for a long term. So that's one of the transferable skills that stays with me. In 2018, when I left Wall Street, uh, that's when I first tried my hand at National Lacrosse League, indoor box lacrosse. I didn't play it when I was growing up. I had always played field lacrosse. I had an opening in my schedule now uh, that I uh, walked away and was trying to take on an entrepreneurial endeavor. I went to San Diego, tried out for an NLL team called the San Diego Seals, got cut came back in 2019, made the team, and then I ended up living out there right before the pandemic. I played in the NLL uh, for three years, four years, four years, and now I'm uh, on the training team to try to make the U.S. box national team for Worlds in, in September this year. And I would say if I would look at that time, it was probably the – yes, it was a tough thing for me to do because – there was steadiness in what I had in, in Manhattan and I was kind of jumping out yeah. on my own to take on something that I didn't study in school. I didn't necessarily have the help. I found great mentors though. I reached out to my mentor coach from Yale. Uh, he put me in touch with a, a mentor that I still have to this day, Dr. Rob Gilbert out of New Jersey. I uh, am learning underneath Dr. Christina Versari at San Diego University for Integrative Studies. I met her when I was out in San Diego and that's what I would just point to uh, you have to find the mentors and role models in your life. I think I said it earlier in my story, but those are the things that really lead you to success. There's people out there that know how mm-hmm. to be successful. And if you can cling on and ask questions and be curious, you know, they're right the path for you. I think you hit a great point too. It's like, I think especially early on in your career, like I, maybe I like you want to be successful and you want to do those things. And like you, yes, people take, you know, sometimes take risks or they'll try really hard in their specific role. But I think a lot of the time it's a lot of the success you can see early on is like using the the fact that you may be a little, not necessarily naive, but like you don't know everything. And if you can soak up a lot of stuff around you from people who are successful and find the people that not only are successful, but like have a plan and have an understanding of how they're succeeding in their business and tracking and setting themselves up for success. I think you hit that. um, I I like that point a lot of it. It just, it's going to prepare you. You're going to learn a lot and you're going to find that, you know, you're, you're developing by trying to learn from more people. And I, I really like when you said that. So what was, uh, you know, the PLL kind of, when did you start hearing about it? When did, when did like draft stuff start coming up and like, was it super quick? Like, was it all of a sudden like, all right, here we go. It was so serendipitous, Joe, because I had left wall street and they start in 2018 and they started the PLL in 2019 and we're offering health benefits. What I needed as I was starting a, a company, uh, Pro Lacrosse has been around since 2000, 2001, and it was Major League mm-hmm. Lacrosse, and they were geographically based. Uh, I was playing for the Chesapeake Bayhawks based out of Annapolis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the Lacrosse League came along, we went back to a tour-based model. Um, that that was really exciting because we had signed a deal with NBC, which became ESPN over time. They do a great job in digital marketing and social media even to this day. And now, this upcoming year, uh, we'll be going back to those geographical based teams. So our Carolina chaos 
um, will now be one of the eight cities. So super exciting. I think what they do a great job of, as I already pointed out, is they started treating the athletes with uh, such a high, at, at such a high level. They yeah. have the Stedman Clinic on the medical side. They do an exceptional job on the social media side. They give mm-hmm. the health benefit and a salary that's um, something that uh, is moving in the right direction towards uh, the lacrosse player becoming a full-time pro. So where did you, uh, what, what, uh, I can also look it up, but like when, when did you get drafted and like what, like position wise or like, or like, I mean, like what, what, where in the draft maybe. And then also like, uh, what was like in 2019, you were an all-star and then you also won like, a, a, a what was it called? The Jimmy Regan team award. Um, and then you also won a championship in 2021, just as, you know, as much as you want to tell us a little about those successes you've seen in your PLO career. And then we can definitely more dive into some more of a like peak performance and some things like that. But I'd love to hear about some of the, and potentially also some of the lows maybe on, on, you know, the PLO side of things. And uh, before we actually jump to peak performance, I thought of another question, but um, yeah, tell us a little about like some of the little accolades you've seen so far in the PLO you've had success in your career. And what were those like? My, my senior year at Yale, I was having a pretty good year and, uh, I got reached out to by Shea, uh, who's the head coach there, and said, there's a couple coaches asking, do you want to play at the next level? I ended up uh, getting drafted 30th and playing for the Chesapeake Bay Hawks for two years. Yeah, the, the, it, in my pro career to this day, I, and I think it's the highest honor I've ever been giving is that teammate of, year, of the year award. I, I connected sure. with uh, Jimmy Regan's father, and it's just, it's just an amazing thing uh, the PLL is doing and um, how uh, Rangers lead the way, and, and that foundation uh, does an exceptional job. So to, still to this day, that's something that I'm most proud of in terms of the lows, um, but are very pivotal because we were talking about it before. Our breakdowns become our breakthroughs. In 2020, we were playing in the championship. Um, up big in the in the fourth quarter and ended up losing the game and I went through a lot of doubt after that Joe I, I, I didn't know if I'd ever get back to a championship it was probably my fourth year playing I was the captain of the team and I had to really go back and and and, and go back to the drawing board and, and figure out how I'm going to be a better source of defensive midfielder and a better captain and lead and and then in 2021 we did bounce bounce back and win it so it is that kind of fall into chaos no pun intended, and then find higher <laughs> order. And, and it was it was just a it was such a, a great experience. And and to now uh, be going into my ninth year with such a, a great group of, of gentlemen, I'm really looking forward to this upcoming year too. Awesome, man, dude, that, that's fantastic. And uh, I love the pun there, by the way. Um, and I think for everyone watching this season, I was excited to see the team move to Carolina. I knew it was probably going to land in Charlotte, but that's actually where my brother lives. But <laughs> I, I thought I for a slim second there because I I don't know I think it was around the time the Canes like resigned at PNC and I was like maybe they'll come to Raleigh maybe they'll come to Raleigh I just moved to Raleigh probably like almost a year ago the area and so like I was like oh that'd be sick because like I could go so you have no Raleigh. excuse not to come to a game no excuse. well exactly 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 so um gonna have to have, check out some chaos games for sure when I'm visiting absolutely and I'll, I'll let you up I'll make sure I'll be like hey Mark how's it going we'll definitely have to hit up before the game easily um but. You know, have you, so you said you're living in Florida. Do you have to relocate here for like the season and like, you know, stay around Charlotte? No, we still fly out every single weekend. I think if you were to ask me in three to five years time, we'll be at that stage where, you know, maybe right now we'll have a couple guys move to market, uh, but guys won't probably be asked to move to market. I would say three to five years time. Cool. Lastly, before we jump into what you're doing off and what you're currently doing now, which is great. Um, Two two questions. One, what's it like being a Nike athlete? If you still are, and like, what what's what what was what's that experience been like? And then two, um, with the Olympics coming up, and I feel like you just you said you were just in Tokyo. I I, I saw some pictures from like, we, if you guys were playing there. Like, I would love to know your take on. Do you think potentially lacrosse is something that could be an Olympic sport? But we'll start with the Nike side first. Well. To answer the Nike side, Mike Fisher is my rep there, and he's one of the greatest guys I know. It's it's a, a privilege and an honor to represent the swoosh. I think if you would ask me as a young athlete, if I'd be a Nike athlete one day, I, I still remember uh, moving to tears uh, when I was asked to become one, and I really love it. Uh, I'm a sneakerhead, so uh, they're, they're all I really wear on my feet. And, love and it. they're the only – Nike lacrosse is the only uh, brand out there in the lacrosse side of things that fits people out from, from neck to toe. Uh, and – 
what I would say is when I met Mike and, and had joined the national training team for field and box, uh, we were having great conversations. And I think what I really wanted was not just the swoosh, but I felt like the trajectory in which the, the brand was going um, and, and to serve different areas, both men and women's different underserved areas and things like that. So I've been doing my very best, um, just gave away a, a Nike lacrosse stick in Tokyo uh, to about a, a nine-year-old. So we're going international with it, which has That's been awesome. exciting. And the second part is um, it will be an Olympic sport in 2028. Uh, a few months ago, it, it got the nod, so that's really exciting. Must, It'll I, be I, a sixes format, which is kind of like a five, five, five on five, and we'll see it in 2028. That's sick. See, I, I knew when I asked that was, hey, is lacrosse going to be included? I should have done a little bit more research, but that's, that's going to be really cool. I think that's one going to bring a lot of light to the sport, even more light to the sport, but also – going to be some great matchups for sure. I think there's going to be some great, great matchups. So that'd be really cool to see. Does the PLO currently do something like with an international circuit or anything like international games or? In February, they do something called the championship series, which is the same format. It is this five on five up and down with a goalie in each net. And it's like basketball where you kind of turn and rake it out of the net and you're going back and it's high scoring mm -hmm. really fast and um, engaging cool. for everybody to watch. And we're doing our very best to, to keep eyes on it, not just in the summer um, leading into the fall, but also um, as the winter becomes spring. That's going to be really cool. Excited. When do you guys like, find out about the team there and doing all that do you is that even murmurs even started yet or anything about that or well the way that would work is throughout the regular season the top four teams by the end of the regular season get the nod and they're the four teams that play in that championship uh, series every february so it's based okay. on the regular season and then anything can happen in the playoffs my bad my bad fair point fair point i meant like for like 2028 Olympics, when would like, like when did they, how did they, how does that get decided? Who make, how like, how will you guys decide who goes on the Olympic team? Well, every four years that there's a training cycle. So the, the uh, USA won gold in the Tanya Israel in 2018 due to COVID got bumped back a year and, and won gold again in 2023. So now there'll be a sixes format, I believe in 2026. Uh, the box is going on in 2024, and then in 2027, 28, uh, the national team just gets cut down uh, on the years and months leading up to, 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 the, to the big stage. And is sometimes like you see in like the hockey side of the Olympics, right? Sometimes it's college athlete. Is the PLL team for the Olympics, or not the PLL, but the Olympic team, is that going to be made up of some college athletes, you think, and PLLs, or just like mix and match, like, or like is that kind of already figured out with like the national team? The, the Sixers format that, that was just played, I guess it was two years ago, there were uh, a few um, from both Canada and America that were high teenagers, low 20s, college yeah. guys that will make the team. So there's usually uh, you okay. know one to four that make the team. Gotcha. That's pretty cool. Huh. Well, going to be watching for sure. I appreciate that. Now we can definitely dive into peak performance. Would love to know. Like I think if anybody who's been listening so far, they, they, they can definitely hear you have a passion for it. And I think that's also something that's really cool to have a passion for because you're at the you're trying to help people, which I think is really, really awesome. You're trying to help athletes be the best that they can be and help them overcome their own internal whether you know, learning that from, you know, yourself and learning, wishing that you had that you mentioned that, you know, when you were going through that time in high school. I think that's really honorable. So would love to hear about peak performance. Uh, definitely talk about the Meaningful Growth Foundation too, but would Tell us a little about that. When do you kind of got the idea? You know, how's how's it going? And, you know, wh what's what's been some cool things you've seen along the way as far as like growth and just dive into it all. I would love to learn all about it. I, I will say, and, and thanks for the space to do so. You bring up the word passion. I was just listening to a, a podcast with Daniel Priestley, and he said, passion is three things. It's origin, vision, and mission. And I think if you look back at the origin, I've always had that care for what I'm doing now, yeah. even if it was 17 or earlier. Um, I have a vision to bring mental performance to a place where it should be, I think, in terms of sports psychology. And uh, my mission is something that I do every single day. So that's sessions with clients individually and with teams. Going back to New York time in New York City, Joe, 
perhaps the best part of my day was that 22 minute subway subway ride where I could read about peak performance, think about it, listen to podcasts, start to write about it. And, and I had a burning desire to do it. How it came about though, is I had uh, two high school student athletes that I was kind of mentoring at the time. And, and one of the fathers said to me, you should do this for other athletes. And I said, that's a big leap of faith to jump away from wall street. There's a lot of security, what I was doing. Absolutely. And I, I did take that leap of faith and, and I, I left and I started with, you know, what do I know? Well, niche wise. Well, I said, probably the, the, the boy high school student athlete that was looking to play at the next level. So that's where I started. And then now beyond five years, it's men and women. College, stu college student athletes, college teams, pro athletes, uh, a couple of Olympics, and and then entrepreneurs and executives. So it grew wow. just by, because I would say it's something that I wake up thinking about. And I'll talk mm -hmm. about it if you give me an hour or two. And if we're at <laughs> dinner, I'm probably going to ask you about your personality or your or sports psychology and, and how you perform in your craft. And I just love learning about it and having conversations. So it's what makes me tick. Joe. And, and, yeah. and I think just diving into it fully, um, Mark Placini Peak Performance came from the, the idea that every single thing matters in terms of holistic health, right? So what I learned from Dr. Brasari was that mind, body, spirit approach. And, and I've not only used it on the lacrosse field myself, but now I get the opportunity to, to work with individuals and do it. And then the small plug I would give for the Mark Placini Meaningful Growth Foundation is in January, January 2021, I started a foundation and what separates it from the hundreds of other cancer foundations is we give direct financial and emotional support to those who are waiting to have money to pay for medical housing or transportation. And we, wow. to this moment, helped 66 cancer patients and their families pay for these medical bills. And we're running a golf outing for the second annual this upcoming May 13th at New York Country Club. So super exciting. Oh. The heartwarming letters we get uh, it, obviously, it, it is near and dear to our heart, just like Mark Lucini Peak Performance is on the for-profit, the non-for-profit 501c3 that we do. My, my my parents and my sister are on the board. So my sister is the vice president. My dad's the treasurer. And my sister's, I mean, my mother is the, the secretary. So it's kind of a, a family affair in which we're, yeah. we're doing our very best to grow the community. If anybody's interested, we continue to grow something called our growth team, um, which are our ambassador, ambassadors nation and globally. So if you're, you're looking to join something from a volunteer's perspective, I would throw that out there. And, and now I digress yeah. and, and, and I'll stop with the plug. Dude, no, no, no. I, I appreciate it. And it's funny. Like I, I wear this wristband all the time. Um, we do something similar. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Crutzfeld Jakob disease, but a uh, family friend of ours passed away from it. Um, last year did, you know, first annual kind of golf tournament for him to raise money, get donations, um, you know, try to get a really, really large donation for a great cause to, you know, you know, also raise awareness about the disease. It's, it is very rare, but um, had a lot of great success and had a lot of great people come out and donate and also, you know, see the difference that they can make. And it's really cool hearing you do something similar. Um, that's really awesome. And definitely, I I'm definitely interested. We'll definitely talk a little bit more about it off, you know, outside of the interview for two. I'd love to, you know, talk to you a little bit about it because that's that definitely sounds great um is there anything maybe in your time running that because you know i think a big thing about my show too is i love talking to sports and you know athletes and things like that but i think a lot of people you know i think what people do also just on a day-to-day -day basis whether you're in sales marketing economic like a wall street trader or broker or you know whatever you do there's something interesting to that job that you do and i think learning the ins and outs of businesses and what people do running their businesses. I spoke with some great um, uh, real estate agents and property management, Richie property Man management last week. And they talked a lot about business. So, or, you know, they talked a lot about their business that they grew and, you know, you learned a lot about that side of things as well. I would love to learn maybe some things you've seen be successful in your business career or, you know, things that were similar to like maybe what I asked you on the lacrosse field, you know, something in your career that was something maybe was pivotal or, you know, something that helped you kind of, or you had to overcome something. I would love to learn, you know, from the business perspective, some things that you've, not only that, but like the foundation as well, like what you've seen and some things you've had to overcome and you've seen some great growth. It's an excellent question. I appreciate you asking it. Something I think about a lot. And I already talked about the role models and mentors. However, I don't think there should ever be a time where you stop doing that. 
You know, if you're mm-hmm. in your 60s, find a mentor that's in their 90s. If you're a 16-year-old, find one in their, in, your, in their 60s. And I think the other two things that I would point to is having standards. You have to have standards for yourself and then the daily action. So what that means is I think what drives us is how should you act at a stoplight? You should stop. But what do we do individually? Like, what are your standards that you're going to hold on to yourself from a sustainability perspective? And the last thing I would say is... You have to have goals because we don't experience positive emotion or positive emotion unless we have an aim and decrease the distance between that aim. So you have to kind of write down what you want, but then it comes down to daily action. So thoughts determine what we want. Action determines what we get. The last thing I would say about all of this is I heard Mark Cuban say, um, and whether this is controversial or not, I believe, I believe it is. He says, there's no such thing as selling. You just find the people um, that are looking for, for what you're offering. And if you can yeah. provide a great customer service, whether it is real estate, whether it is you're the best architect, whether it is um, you name it, uh, you're in the t- entertainment business or whatever, mm-hmm. be so great at your craft. Be unbelievable at your craft in terms of caring about other people, um, being there, for other people and providing an exceptional service. And, and once you do that, I believe that things will fall into place because those who become self-conscious and egotistical, I think that's where everything falls apart. And I think if you can lose yourself in the work and in the service, you'll find success no matter where you go. I agree. I think something that you love doing is big of that. And I think being able to you know, find something that you're good at and sharpening that tool and putting you know everything you have into it i think makes a huge difference um again last minute i i feel just because you're such a great guy and you're so determined and just like yeah again i i i i I feel bad having asked this last question because it's so off the wall and i just would love to get your input on it i've asked it to a million different people and people who i didn't think i'd get answers from in that like i said you don't even have or i didn't say it but if you don't want to answer you don't even have to but um again you seem like a great guy and you seem like one of the most, you know, hardworking individual I've ever met, but um, maybe stuff one, well, well, let's ask this question first. What do you like to do in your free time outside? You know, obviously you're getting your degree, you're got your graduate school, you're playing professional cross, you're doing great things with the meaningful growth foundation. You're doing Mark Lucini uh, peak performance. You got a lot going on. How do you get away from that? What's some stuff you like doing in your free time? And then I'll get to my ridiculous question. Dr. Rob Gilbert always says to me, Mark, you should be a monomaniac on a mission. Stop being well-rounded. And I, thought, I, I find that <laughs> hysterical, right? And another thing that he says is, rather than being a wandering generality, be a meaningful specific. So it is definitely true that I am obsessed with the craft of sport and performance mm-hmm. psychology, definitely. Outside of that, like right now, I'm calling in from Hawaii. Um, I'll be hiking every single day. I, I wasn't a big reader in high school and, and before. Now I am a big reader. I met Anson Dorrance, um, had him on my podcast. Anson Dorrance was the UNC women's soccer coach, coach of Mia Ham, and uh, has 21 national championships, maybe even more. I better uh, make sure I edit that. It might be 22. <laughs> and, and what he said to me is, you know, if you want to be a coach, how many books are you reading? And I said, uh, you know, one, maybe two at the time. And he said, you got to be re- reading way more than that all at once. And I was kind of blown away. I was like, that touched a little bit too much, but I am doing that now. I, I find myself listening to a few audibles while picking up different books and making different connections along the way. So if it's not uh, traveling uh, and adventuring, hiking, it, it would be reading and then having coffee and, and great conversations like my man with Joe. Wow. Oh, I like that. I like that. Uh, I like I, I, you know, it's funny, my wife, big reader, kind of, kind of where you're probably at now can not only buzz through books, but have great reading comprehension and taking things away from them. Um, I definitely could read more. And I think I, you know, you're always looking for that person to kind of maybe push you in that direction. I, I think, you know, my wife does a great job of, you know, like you said, having like a reader, having like, uh, you know, physical books too. And I think, it's definitely something I think I should, you know, get more into. I think it's just going to, you know, not only keep you intellectually sharp, but also, you know, you're going to learn more. I will say this. I heard recently that you can read at a rate of 225 words per minute, but you can listen closer to 500. And I, I think the people in my life think it's ridiculous, but I'm always times two speed all the way up to 3.5 speed of podcasts and book yeah. because I'm trying to get through it and take a, If there's something that really fascinates me, I'll hit back 15 seconds or back 30 seconds and re-listen to it slower. 
you just have to look for those diamonds in the rough because when you're reading mm -hmm. a book, when you're listening to a podcast, when you're listening to an audible, you have to find those things that grip you. And I think that not enough people are doing things that grip you. And there's an, a thing and I, I wish I could give it to the, the individual that said it is um, you have to find those things that make you come alive. And I think that m many people have found themselves wandering and you have to look back at your origin your vision and your mission and see what lights you on fire. And if you can light yourself on fire every single day, won't be work, but you will probably find a calling inside of it. Because when people ask me about that time, like you have today, like 2018, wow, very courageous. It, to me, it was, it was something I was super excited about, right? It yeah. made me tick. So you got to ask yourself, what makes you tick? Write down a list of those things, circle the ones that jump out even more, and then you could be the best in, in, in your community. I think you're going to find success. I think you, that's one of the main reasons I started doing this is just that from like its basic core, I just like talking to people. And I like learning. You know, I think a lot of people do a lot of interesting things. And I think, like you said, that's a great statistic. I think I might steal from you that you can hear more words than you can, you know, speak more words. And I, or, re, or, you know, re, like, you know, here as opposed to reading Read. them and see so like copyright so like i i think you know that's something that's true like this makes me tick talking to individuals learning about them think, seeing what they find interesting or what the pa they're passionate about and being like is that to your point is that something that i could see some overlap in my my own you know day to day or it's something i could make my life better so i i i think that's definitely hit the nail on the head um and then lastly so definitely not a book um so I, I i'm not sure if you have but i usually preface it with this because like i i definitely it, it definitely kind of helps sell the scene and i don't know when i started asking this question to people but i've asked it to college basketball coaches architects and interior designers hockey players formula drivers individuals who i don't even think would know this question but it's one of those it's definitely an out there question but it's one of those that could be thought-provoking um have you ever seen the movie Step Brothers? course of course okay. so that's gonna make this a lot easier um when dale and brandon are going to the school and they pass it they're like freaking out and then they get their ass kicked part of my language uh they get they get their ass kicked by the fifth graders and you know it's this whole fight but at the end they kind of go back and you know fight them so in that kind of situation right kind of painting the picture let's say you're in that somewhat kind of situation and there's just i don't know if it's recess just got out pe something you got like a swarm of fifth graders coming at you in that situation. How many do you think you could take down, so to speak, or, you know, fend off before they overpower you and tell me a little bit about why. And it's interesting to your point or, you know, I've, I've heard a bunch of different answers to this question and I like hear it. It's funny. Like I'll hear, I'll, I'll tell more about it after I hear your answer. You, 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 you find that like what you think someone might say or what, you might think is a normal amount, you know, to someone who's been a high tier athlete and plays like arguably one of the toughest sports, you find that even their answers are different. So I'm very curious to hear your response to this. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. It is a ridiculous question. Uh, I'm not going to call him daddy if there's a fire. Um, and <laughs> I can help out with this whole pan pan situation if you want me to. Uh, so I, I guess love it. Love it. what I, what I would say is, um, I would stand my ground as much as I can. How many can I, I take down? It. I'm not swinging any punches. There's no chance of that. I would right. just say, um, I don't know. They're bigger these days. Maybe like six or seven, I probably would stand, you know, as long as I'm in a, in a great posture. So first off, I appreciate you saying that because I can't tell you how many different times I've told people like fifth graders have just progressed so much. They're getting recruited by Saban and these people, I can't say that anybody retired, but they're getting recruited by you know, colleges now just because they're built different. Like, it's crazy. But six or seven is a very respectable answer. And I'll tell you, so like I've heard, like I said, a wide variety. And a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking with former Washington Capitals defender, Carl Osner, six, four, big guy. You know, you would think like defense, hockey guy's going to take down. He said maybe like, I think he said maybe like 10. And in my mind, I was like, I thought you were going to say a number. You say five or six. I respect the hell out of that. I've heard so. I, he's another guy I spoke to. Big, I love the guy. Good dude. He was former uh, NFL Pro Bowler. Played in the NFL for a couple different teams. Dwayne Harris. I asked him. He was like, "I'm beating up all those kids." And I was like, "How you? How do you think you can take down all these fifth graders? Like, there's just no way." And it's funny. Like, I talked to a, 
basketball coach for East Carolina University, Michael Schwartz. He was like similar to what I think Dale brings up is, you know, taking the other road. He was like, I think I'm going to take the other road. I'm going to try and avoid the subject. I was like, I appreciate you answering the question with a movie quote as well. So I appreciate it. But thank you for answering because it is a ridiculous question. It is ridiculous, but it's funny because you never know what someone's going to respond with. And you also learn very quickly, like, you know, how people go about it. And it's just fun to ask. So I appreciate you partaking. Of course. Uh, if you have any more like it, I would love to knock those down too. No, I, I think that's that's usually my most ridiculous question. Yeah, I try to keep it mostly educational, try to get people to understand that to your point about running through podcasts or, you know, people who have a long commute to work, if there's anything that you can take away from it, I, I'd i hope that there'd be some sort of educational, you know, something that someone, at least from one ep- each episode, take one thing away. So I try to keep the ridiculous down to a minimum. Some episodes get away from it, but definitely not this one. So I appreciate it. Um, Before I let you go, You've been an amazing guest, Mark, and I appreciate it. I think, um, hands down, one of the most interesting guests I've had on for sure, just because you're so intellectually sharp and also just, like you said, you see, you carry yourself very well. And I, I, it's definitely noticeable. And you've been so great at answering the questions and diving in. And before I let you, is there any other, you know, topics you want to, you know, briefly plug or talk about? Want to, again, want to give you all the space to, you know, speak on everything that's important to you oh i first say thanks for having me on again i appreciate your relentlessness and and reaching out i'm, I'm glad to be here and, and you do a great job at what you do and i i, I love the the mixture between serious and fun and i guess i would just jump uh, on and, and, and talk about there's a huge huge stigma around mental health and back in the day when you said the word mental um people had a very very big net negative connotation alongside mm-hmm. of that and i think it's interesting because i don't see any difference between training the mind and training the body um you just can't see the growth and people have out there yeah. invisible injuries and don't have um the resources uh to talk to different people um i, I would just say this because um, it was recently said to me that therapy is three things. It's support plus rapport plus insight. And you can get that with a grandparent. You can get that with a loved one. And I would just encourage anybody who's listening to this to express rather than suppress what they're going through. And if you can't find somebody that is in your support system, I would move to journaling. And and the reason why I go from the that brothers to that is because I think a mixture of the serious and fun is what life is all about. And yeah. anybody out there that's listening to this, I think um, they need to know that they're not alone and that they mm-hmm. can find their way through a tough time. And I, I've just uh, seen so much, uh, whether it's uh, athletics, executive, all the way down to people not doing well. And I just want to smash the stigma every step of the way because not doesn't matter who you are. Uh, everybody has tough times and it's not yeah. about the tough times. It's about becoming tougher through that and, and journaling and finding people to talk to. So that would be the last thing I'd have to say. Couldn't have said it better myself, man. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's definitely something, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see where it's progressing, especially in today's, like, I think it is getting, Oh, I, I at least think it's getting better and better about being more talked about and being okay. I agree. I think, there's always been an old stigma of if you're not meant like mentally tough also doesn't necessarily mean you block all those things or suppress it. That's doesn't necessarily always mean what mentally tough is. So I think sometimes even, you know, phrases like that can be misconstrued or have had, you know, paths of places where they could, you know, it can be redefined. So appreciate you bringing that up. I think a lot of people will relate to that. And I think again, you, just like throughout the whole interview, that's a, you could, you could write a book with some of the phrases or, you know, things you said to you today, man, it's impressive. But Mark, um, you know, we'll definitely be rooting for you this year on the field. Also rooting for your success off the field. Would love to definitely talk to you more about um, uh, what you're doing uh, with the Meaningful Growth Foundation. I you know, definitely think we should uh, definitely still talk about, um, you know, that as well. I'd love to hear more about it. But without that, I'll, I'll let you go, man. I appreciate your time, and it's been great. Thanks for having me, Joe. Awesome. You take care, Mark. You too. Bye-bye.